This is Elliot Serrano and Jose Melendez coming to you from Dreamland Comics in Schaumburg, Illinois. Thank you for joining us here on CCW TV, the Comic Culture Warrior video channel. We spent the last segment talking about books that take place out of continuity. We've said that there is a way you can tell really good stories within continuity. The One of the things that folks tend to forget when Marvel, um, this tends to be a byproduct of the writing process, you know, and you're writing out, you know, on a monthly schedule, on a monthly basis, you tend to have huge gaps of time left in stories mm -hmm. between, you know, different events within a monthly title. So that gives you a lot of area that if you want to tell in continuity stories, it gives you a lot of area to play in, provided you know, you're, you're familiar with how... <laughs> one story ended and then how the next story afterwards begins yeah and, and as long as you don't go in and do something stupid like making the main character piss himself <laughs> stupid shit like that you'd be okay yeah anyway so we have among some very clever writers like um tom defalco or uh, uh um kurt buziek who've been able to tell stories from the past that took place in continuity. We also have Christos Gage, who you know we are a fan of here on CCW TV, and his new miniseries, Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four, reuniting Christos with um, Mario, Alberti. Ma Mario Alberti, who he also did the Spider-Man and the X-Men miniseries with last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the follow-up miniseries to, to that. And if... And if you, I think we talked about that. We did. Uh, some we did. Videos. We talked about how go buy the trade. It's, it was a, it was one of the best miniseries last year, best Spider-Man story easily of last year. Here's the thing that gets me about this. I'm gonna say this, and I asked uh, Jose asked me to read this because we were gonna talk about it. And after I was through reading it, I the first thing I asked was, why wasn't Christos Gage part of that group of Spider-Man writers, the Brain Trust, the Brain Trust, who got to take turns on Amazing Spider-Man. Um, Chris Gage and Jeff Parker. The more I read their takes on the Spider-Man character, the more obvious it was to me that they should have been in there. Mm -hmm. They really should have been in there. Outside of Dan Slott and Mark Wade, it's like what, like Zeb Wells and, and the dude that wrote Back to the Future? Yeah, see, Bob but Gale. I would say, see, Zeb Wells and Bob Gale both. I have, mean, Zeb Wells is fine, but I, I, I not really. But they have the Hollywood background. They have the TV background. That's why they were in there. There was this some. There was some sort of idea that if the guy, the guy who wrote the Back to the Future movies, wrote Spider Man, that was one would, of the worst Spider Man yeah, movies ever read too. Yeah, I'm just saying. I didn't get that when he did the Daredevil. No, and they had people in house. They had people who work for them who are fully capable of writing stories a hundred times better. I don't understand how that happens. As a matter of opinion. As, <laughs> fuck, everyone knows it's a matter of opinion. I don't know. I that's know. like the third video you brought that up. I'm just trying to be... I don't know. I'm just trying to be objective, which is... Not being objective. Which you're is just being here. annoying. Yeah. But I, I, I'm saying it right now. As a matter of opinion, Christos Gage does an excellent job with the Spider-Man character here. He does this great job of pairing... Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four in different points throughout their shared histories. Mm -hmm. And and it's just really fun to read. And I sit there and I go, wow, why isn't he working on these characters more? Why isn't Christos Gage writing more Spider-Man? Because you have, especially here, that delicate balance that goes on between um, Spider-Man... The Thing and Johnny Storm, the right. Human Torch. There's that little that it's not. It's like a bromance triangle where they can, they have a love hate relationship, all mm -hmm. of them, and they're constantly on each other. It's Peter Parker and Johnny Storm early in their relationship. Yeah, always they butted heads a lot. Before he knew he was Spider Man. Before he knew he was Spider Man. No, he butted heads with Peter Parker a lot. That's right. right. Well, that's what I'm saying. He butts heads with with Peter Parker and, and Spider -Man, Spider Man in this issue. Yeah. And it's, it's fun to read. It's like yeah. one of those, again, if you've been reading Marvel comics for a long time or you've been reading like the Marvel Essentials and you're going back to some of that, that earlier stuff, that stuff from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And again, this is a story that takes place, I want to say, in, in the, the 70s. Six, the 70s run? I think the 60s 70s. Run? Well, because he's in college here now. 
Was it college? Okay, okay, he's, yeah, yeah he's, that's he's, the 70s. He's in right. college with Gwen Stacy now. Right. So you, you're back in the 70s, and Peter Parker and Johnny Storm cross paths at ESU, and there's this whole thing going down where the Fantastic Four find that they have to serve as a security detail for Doctor Doom. And you want to see Doom being a fucking prick? <laughs> Read this first issue. This is fucking hilarious. It is. It's really It's, really it's, it's him being this evil, malevolent like, guy, and just... Fucking just but the 70s it. version. Right. 70s version right. Doom, which is kind of neat. But it's and then all this stuff goes on, and 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 <laughs> and then as you hit the middle, the you know, complications ensue because of course the Submariner is gonna show up mm-hmm. and and be again as prickish as he's known to mm-hmm. being. And this really, really funny bit happens between Doom and Johnny Storm. I don't want to give that part away because it is a big part of the rest of the story. It's a big though, part of, of the rest issue. of the story. But it, it's really funny that it happens like in three panels. The story takes a huge twist. And and Peter Parker says, did what I think happened really just happen? And it's pre- it's just the joke itself is a payoff. It's okay, a payoff. and this first issue alone, it, it would have taken Bendis to tell this story in four issues. <laughs> there's so much stuff that happens in this one issue. A lot of fun, yeah. And, and there's just... This Mario Alberti art is just fucking beautiful. That's the other thing too I wanted to say that the I mean, um, it suits. Alberti art is it's perfect. Gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Um, is he doing um, straight to pencils or is he? I can't. I he's couldn't doing. Tell. He does. He does all of it. He does all the art. It's just. It's just, it just says art by him. I'm wondering if he. Yeah. You know. It, it just says artist, but I'm wondering artist. if he's so he doing, does the coloring. Obviously, he does the coloring. He does the pencils. He does whatever inks he does. Yeah. But I also like too the the old school like old Marvel school fonts, fonts on the, the bottom. bottom. Yeah, another epic tale. It's from fun. Comics. It's fun. It's just a fun book. And um, and I, seriously, you're not going to read a more fun book. I think this month or maybe the rest of the year mm-hmm. than this book. The take. Oh, they're okay. They're right here in the front. This is one of my favorite bits. They, they throw in this bit where um. Ben Grin is signing um, signing an autograph on campus while one of the Yancey Street Gang is graffitiing his back. His back. It's like this, just these little bits, and, uh, and uh, our Alberti does a gorgeous Gwen Stacy too. You know, does this great, great artwork. So, um, issue one, awesome. Issue two, it gets a little we, bit more serious. We bounce ahead into the eighties. Yes, we go from the seventies to the eighties, specifically the John Byrne era, the tail end of the John Byrne era. Uh, because we have... Uh, oh, the, Fantastic Four. Yeah, Fantastic Four, because uh, Invisible Woman has that bad mullet cut. That and John, She-Hulk's on the team. She And She-Hulk's on the team. Can I say, I think Christos Gage handled that <laughs> dynamic even better than John Byrne did. Because for the longest time, I, I, I oh, I've that read... that mullet haircut? Yeah, that mullet. No, no, yeah. I'm talking about the uh, relationship <laughs> between uh, Jennifer and Johnny Storm. Because... Yeah. Yeah. John Byrne never really dealt a lot with that within the Fantastic Four run. I have all those Fantastic Four issues when She-Hulk joined the team. And he would tease it every once in a while, but he never really, you know, he never went to the links of showing the relationship the two had like Ben Grimm and Johnny had. So for one brief moment, we get to see one of Johnny Storm's um, pranks kind of backfire on him. When it comes to uh, uh, Jennifer Walters, he buys all like all of her clothes in smaller sizes, <laughs> and kind of and pisses her off. And uh, uh, I was like, "Wow, wow!" See that really? I would have loved to have seen more of that. I would have loved to have seen more of that. All right, so this story takes place right after Spider-Man uh, loses a symbiote. Yeah, and 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 because this, this is like a year after Secret War, right? Right. And he and Reed Richards has it. In his lab mm-hmm. for analysis, and uh, I remember reading these stories. Mm-hmm. This kind of fits kind of perfectly within there. Mm-hmm. There is, if 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 there's one thing again that would have made these books even more feel like more timeless kind of stories is editor notes, because there <laughs> there are yeah. there I mean there are still um, dialogue, there is dialogue in here where they talk about stuff that's actually going on in those right. monthly books at the time, like how about how the hobgoblin. Was right. um, like Spider Man's going to the hospital uh, to visit. Uh, who was it again? Uh, the, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, Harry Osborne and uh, Liz, Liz's baby. Mm-hmm. 
and they were attacked by the, the hobgoblin, right. and he's going to the hospital to, to go visit them. And so, you know, there's all this stuff, and it would have been nice, like, that, just as a joke, put editors know this happened in Amazing Spider-Man, right. like, 255 cool. or whatever it was. Yeah, that would have been cool. The, the great thing, though, is that you don't have to really know those bits. Just have, again, a passing knowledge of these characters, and then you can kind of... You just pick it up from there. Just pick yeah. it up from there. So, well, what the X-Men and the Spider-Man story, uh, it took place in different decades, and but it had an overarching story, and Mr. Sinister was the villain behind this. There's a villain here who they're keeping a secret, and there's, they're, they're picking these points in time uh, Crystal Gage is to tell these the story where this villain is working up, you know, a plan. Right. right. And this in the whole he he this guy lets the symbiote loose right. for whatever reason that we we kind of figure out at the end why. But so at this point though, uh, in this story, the symbiote takes over Mr. Fantastic. It's just a creepy scene. Yeah. I mean, it, is. it really is. And is Mr. Fantastic being? I had, I don't, can't remember the last time besides in the Hickman run where. He's so, like, not selfish and acting like a hero. Right. You know, right. you see Mr. Fantastic acting like a hero. It's like, I can't remember. And the, and you really get the relationships he has with the other yes. family members, especially the relationship between him and Sue Storm, which, um, I'm sorry, Mark Miller really, he had one good scene between the two of them in um, his Fantastic Four run, but beyond that, I don't think he really had a handle on them. Here... Dead. I, I don't see why it's Crystal, so hard for I know. people to get that. Crystal you know? Gage in two issues mm-hmm. already has given so much story, uh, backstory for Fantastic Four and the character relations, right? Uh, relationships between the two. I don't get how hard it, he makes it look easy. Yeah, but we, obviously yeah. it's not because a lot of people can't, can't do get it. it. Right, right. So, so yeah. So the symbiote gets loose and takes over Mr. Fantastic, takes over She-Hulk, takes over Invisible Woman, and is ultimately after Franklin, Franklin. because the symbiote can feel that Franklin does have untapped powers, right. because at this point he hasn't developed them yet. Right. That would come later on in the John Byrne run. Right. And so, they're actually supposed to be, I uh, think um, Hickman said he's bringing them back in the current he, Yeah, he, is, yeah, he is building, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but th- this is a book that I'm afraid. I mean, for what it is, it's not going to get a whole lot of. It's not going to get enough attention. Uh, I don't even is... know where how. The, how did the first issue sell? I have no idea. I'm, I'll... Well, obviously, it wasn't the top ten. It wasn't no. It wasn't. It well, wasn't I don't even know. If, it wasn't it was even the top the, twenty-five. It might have, no, it wasn't the top twenty-five. I don't know if it was even the ten, top fifty. I'll go home and I'll and so uh, I should really have those numbers uh, in front of me whenever See, we talk the, about the, this. But the thing that but yeah, me. this is one of the best Marvel comics. Yeah. It's a really good book, and no one's going. Yeah, no one's, and but no one's, pick, and no one's going to pick it up in the numbers that really, in our opinion, <laughs> it deserves. And speaking of our opinion, before people like you just, you just did three segments on Marvel books. I'm going to explain to you why. Not that I have to, but I'm going to. John Lehman wrote this book, and it is also we wanted to talk about that, and, that, and also how these one shots that Marvel puts out are really not necessary. And they're flying the market with these kind of things. Second video, we did these two books. Two books that might as well be independent books because nobody is paying any attention to them. And even if they are, for some reason, they're not enjoying them. And I don't understand where that comes from. That's why we're setting the record straight with these two. And this, we're picking up because, again, no sales comparable to what, what is going on in the top 25. One of the best comic books easily that Marvel is doing. Top three best comic books that Marvel and the other two are this one, <laughs> so of the week. So I don't know. These are just books that need to be talked about, and that's why if they just all happen to be Marvel, they all happen to be Marvel. Right. Sometimes we talk about all DC. It just happens that way because these are things that we need to talk about, that we feel a need to talk about. Yeah. We can't. We can't help who's publishing them. Yeah. And and again, uh, there's this idea out there that we hate Marvel. We don't hate Marvel. In fact, Marvel does a lot of good stuff, so we want to make And we're sure helping you sift through all the shit that Marvel puts out <laughs> to get to the good stuff. Get to the good stuff. Yes. When we come back, we'll have Last Rants. I think you're going to want to listen to this one. They always do. 